Okay, here we go. Finally, <laughs> sorry about all the confusion, folks, and uh, I'm glad you were able to pull it all together very nicely. Let me just uh, close some of these silly things out here. Hmm. I don't know how to get rid of that uh, thing at the top. <laughs> There we go. Thank you. All right. So figure out what I'm doing here. <laughs> so welcome and thanks everybody for coming. And uh, for those out in Zoom land, uh, welcome also. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Chris Wood. And in fact, if you do know me, I'm still Chris Wood. But uh, <laughs> the uh, I've been a, a birder and a photographer uh, for over 45 years, um, mostly here in Connecticut, but only recently did I really become enthralled by hummingbirds. Uh, several years ago when I started spending winters in Arizona and uh, traveling to the neotropics um, more or less regularly. And um, that really all of a sudden discovered uh, a whole new set of, uh, of uh, birds to really appreciate. Um, and I'm also, by the way, happy to be presenting in person. This, I've done a lot of presentations over the last several years and most of them have been exclusively Zoom, which uh, is okay, but it's kind of nice to have people looking to, that you can look at and see and make eye contact with. So thanks for coming out tonight. I appreciate it uh, as a personal benefit for me uh, for, for doing this kind of stuff. So anyway. We're, uh, of course, all familiar with our resident hummingbird, the ruby-throated hummingbird. Uh, but, uh, you know, as pretty as this particular bird is and how much we all enjoy it, it's really just a sample of uh, the, these uh, colorful and energetic and captivating uh, birds uh, known as hummingbirds. Right. I've got to warn you now, um, this is not just going to be a slideshow of pretty pictures because I'm going to try to teach you something about hummingbirds. Most of you probably know it. A lot of you, I'm sure, have traveled to the Neotropics mm -hmm. and seen a lot of hummingbirds. But hopefully you'll pick up a couple couple of new facts and figures about uh, hummingbirds that you'll find interesting. And uh, I hope that I can show you uh, why you should marvel at hummingbirds, um, even even just our own humming uh, ruby-throated hummingbird. And not just for their, uh, their beauty and their attractiveness, but how they really demonstrate the amazing process of evolution uh, and the intricacies of ecological systems. They show it all. So what is a hummingbird? It's in the, the family Trochilidae, it's called. They're cl most closely related to uh, uh, the swifts. They probably uh, uh, branched off from the swifts like some 22 million years ago. I think I'll touch on that in a minute. Uh, how, and how they, uh, uh, 42 million years ago, sorry. Uh, how they came to the Americas is uh, unsure because it appears that the first fossils found of hummingbirds uh, were uh, from 30, 35 million years ago in Europe. Uh, but of course, hummingbirds don't occur in Europe anymore. They're exclusively a Western Hemisphere uh, uh, group of birds. Um, and uh, exactly how they got to the New World is not really clear, very likely over the same uh, Bering Sea uh, land bridge that uh, comes and goes over the millennia, uh, same as how humans got here. Uh, they're one of the most diverse avian families in the world. There's some 360 different species and they're still speciating pretty rapidly. We don't really see that necessarily directly uh, in our time frames, but, uh, but it's true and that's what they are doing. And they are called Rays of the Sun. That's why I titled this show The Rays of the Sun with Zitzel uh, by the Aztecs, who also thought that they were the reincarnations of brave war warriors because of their behavior and how aggressive they were. 
Um, they uh, like to remember their fighting friends uh, uh, in the good old days when they were humans and they uh, uh, look at hummingbirds and, and pretend that that's, that was their fighting friend. Just a note that I just actually looked up today again to confirm my thoughts. Hummingbirds only live three to five years on average in the northern hemisphere, in, in the northern part of the uh, the neo, of the uh, western hemisphere. Uh, and in fact, most of them die in their very first year. Uh, it's a tough life. Uh, the non-migratory species in the neotropics may live as long as ten years. So there's three basic groups uh, taxonomically of, of hummingbirds. There's the, the uh, uh, Jacobins and uh, uh, topazes. Uh, this is a, a white-necked Jacobin. Uh, there's uh, one of these are probably some of the earliest forms of hummingbirds. And you can see that by looking at how heavy the bill and thick the bill is. Um, Uh, and this is a uh, hermit. This is a group of uh, birds that is about, uh, uh, I forget how many species, I'll come to it in a minute. But at any rate, the hermits are one of, also one of the earliest forms of hummingbirds. And uh, it's thought that they evolved first in, in Brazil uh, and um, mostly as insect eaters. But as time went on and they were picking insects out of the flowers, they kind of learned that the flowers had this little sweet sugar and they started uh, drinking that. Then at the same time as the Andes Mountains rose up uh, through the plate tectonics, different species started moving up the hills up into the mountains and evolved and became more uh, almost exclusively nectar eaters in the flowers of the mountains. Now about uh, half of all hummingbirds now uh, live in the Andes Mountains, up in the Andes. And I'll talk more about some of those. And all that resulted in, in this, this is one of the more colorfuls of, of the typical hummingbirds. So we got topazes and jacobins, we got hermits, and we have typical hummingbirds, which are by far the, the most numerous. There's over 300 species of typical, what are considered typical hummingbirds. This is a fiery-throated hummingbird, uh, only occurs in Panama and uh, uh, southern Costa Rica. Yeah. There's uh, North American hummingbirds. There's only uh, some 24 different species that have occurred, uh, been recorded in, in North America, that is north of Mexico. Um, I've managed to photograph 14 of them uh, in, Can in the United States. Um, at least 10 of the 24 that, that have been recorded here are very, very rare. Uh, and, uh, and pretty sporadic. Um, the ruby-throated, again, uh, is uh, the only species that breeds east of the Great Plains uh, in the United States. And uh, that makes us something at a disadvantage hummingbird-wise uh, here in the Northeast, where we really have one regularly occurring species, the ruby-throated. And the reason for that, which is pretty interesting when you think about it, is Basically, the homogene uh, homogeneity of our forests in the East, at least historically, not so much today, but historically over evolutionary periods, uh, is a pretty homogeneous forest cover, uh, and also the Gulf of Mexico as a barrier for migration. Uh, although the ruby-throated is the only hummingbird that actually crosses the Gulf of Mexico uh, in migration. Um, but... Uh, we're always happy to see the adult male in our gardens, and that's uh, always a good reason to plant flowers like these uh, coral bells uh, and uh, cardinal flowers and the like in our gardens. <laughs> so we can get these uh, these folks to come around and liven up our day. I want you to note the uh, wing position uh, of this particular bird, because I'm going to come back to that uh, in a while. Okay, so these are your photos? These are all my photos. Wow. I've uh, I've seen about 110 different species. I've photographed about 100 different species. And uh, these are all my photos. This is a, a young female hummingbird in my yard. And you know that because if you look at the tail feathers, you see how sharp and clean these tail feather edges are. If this was an adult bird, 
in the summertime, those would be worn down because they haven't molted into their new flowers. They don't do that until they get to their wintering grounds. So that's how you know that this is a first year, uh, uh, essentially a baby bird, but it's in its uh, first uh, uh, pre-basic plumage. And I'll show you uh, what hummingbirds, uh, ruby, our ruby-throated hummingbirds do. This is their migration pattern. Uh, it doesn't show them going over the Gulf of Mexico, but they do. A lot of them do go around the coast of Texas and along the coast of Mexico to get into uh, <laughs> central and southern Mexico. Uh, but a lot of them do fly that 500 miles from uh, along the Gulf Coast over to the Yucatan Peninsula. Now, one other bird that we do get, hummingbird we do get occasionally in Connecticut is a rufous hummingbird. This bird I photographed actually in a yard in Westport uh, back in uh, 2018. This was in the fall. That's when they usually may show up and I'll show you why in a moment. Uh, there's only a few other uh, hummingbirds that are, have been recorded basically on the, on the east coast of uh, the United States. Uh, Mexican violet ear has been seen once in Connecticut. A broad-tailed hummingbird has been seen twice in Connecticut, uh, but that's pretty much about it. No. Allen's has not been officially recorded in Connecticut yet. No, we, have, we had one last year, but it was, I mean, you know, they wouldn't let us say that it was not me, but a friend. Well, I'll, I'll talk about that yeah, in a minute, okay. in a moment, actually. Um, now, Rufus hummingbirds, as I say, is the one that we may most likely get uh, as, a, as a vagrant here in Connecticut. And part of the reason might be their migratory pattern. They go up the West Coast, they come down on the East Slope of the Rocky Mountains. So if they are over here in the Rocky Mountains coming south, they'll get caught up and they can get caught up in some of those wind shears that carry across the, the uh, country. And that's a unique migratory pattern uh, among hummingbirds. So that may partly explain why we see them here occasionally. Uh, in Connecticut and on the East Coast. Now we were just talking about Allen's hummingbirds and the possibility that sometimes we may get one. I banned uh, uh, Rufus hummingbirds with my friend Mark Zantier who has a banding permit. Uh, and uh, whenever there's a Rufus in Connecticut, if you can get permission from the, the, they're almost always at somebody's feet or in their yard. And if you can get permission, we go and, uh, and set up a trap catch it and inspect it, measure it, weigh it, band it. And, uh, and inspect it to determine for sure that it's a Rufus and not, uh, not an Allens. For years, uh, people thought that there was a definitive uh, um, way to distinguish the two by, by the green back on the Allens hummingbird. Uh, but that turns out to be not so much true because this is a Rufus hummingbird, it's an immature bird, but it has a green back. Mm -hmm. So you just can't, you can't rely on that, uh, that old uh, green back. But what you can rely on is the tail feathers. Uh, the Rufus hummingbird, this is an Allen's hummingbird. The Rufus hummingbird, where you see that arrow, would there would be a notch in that feather. That's the, uh, uh, the second uh, tail feather. Tail feathers are numbered from the inside. One, two, three, four, five. Four and five are very narrow and pointed on uh, an Allen hummingbird, uh, and there's no notch in number two on an Allen hummingbird. On a uh, Rufus hummingbird, there would be the notch, and these two tail feathers would be blunt and rounded. So that's how you tell, but you have to have it in your hand. It's really not the kind of thing you can, or you get really good photographs like this, but you can't really tell it when it's flying around your yard, going from plant to plant or feeder to feeder. So let's move uh, west where there's more hummingbirds, at least in, the, in North America. This is where to go. Uh, southwest Arizona and, uh, is kind of the uh, hummingbird capital of uh, the United States anyway, be because these uh, uh, a lot of rare hummingbirds can sneak in across the big, beautiful wall that we have here separating Mexico from the United States. This is in the San Rafael grasslands in southern Arizona. And that is the wall between, uh, this is Mexico, that hill in the background, and this is the United States. So we're safe. 
<laughs> Obviously, from all those people that want to do the work that we don't want to do, but I, I don't want to get political here. And the Lucifer hummingbird is one of those species that does pop uh, over the border. And uh, in fact, it seems to me that they're getting a little more common because uh, uh, time was I had to uh, drive a good ways to chase one that was only there for a day or two. But the last time I, I was in Arizona in July, and yes, it was hot. It was 110 degrees in the parking lots of restaurants. But we birded hard uh, for a week and uh, saw Lucifer hummingbirds at four or five different locations, including one on a nest. So I suspect that they are actually kind of uh, starting to range, uh, expand their range a little bit north. This is another shot of a Lucifer hummingbird with a beautiful uh, gorget, uh, beautiful purple color. The amazing different shades of purple on these, uh, many of these hummingbirds anyway. This is another rarity that also nested uh, this year at Ramsey Canyon, I don't know if anybody, I imagine some of you have been to Ramsey Canyon uh, in Southern Arizona. Uh, and uh, this uh, uh, this bird shows up occasionally, but again, it's uh, it may be uh, expanding its range a little north uh, and finding a suitable habitat. This is, a, this is one of them on the nest at Ramsey Canyon this year and the typical hummingbird nest that's camouflaged with lichen uh, and uh, very tiny. It looks big there, but it's really very, very tiny, as you know, by looking at hummingbirds, you can tell that it's probably about the size of uh, I don't know, a golf ball, something like that. She was diligently feeding two babies. Every once in a while, you could see their heads stick up. You can actually see, you can just barely make out the bill of one of the babies right there. And I'll talk a little more about female hummingbirds in a bit. Uh, es un calibre muy magnifico. This is the bird that used to be called the magnificent hummingbird. Uh, its name had to revert to Rivoli's hummingbird uh, because of some arcane uh, nomenclature rules, it, but it was previously known as the magnificent hummingbird, but then it was split from the Talamanca hummingbird of uh, uh, Panama and so they had to revert to an older name. This guy was some duke that sponsored some explorer who first identified and named this bird. So, uh, you know, some so this guy was trying to curry favor with his sponsor, probably. So, uh, so he named the bird after him. Um, it's hopefully one of the birds that they will get around to renaming to a more appropriate name. And I'll talk a little bit more about hummingbird names and my particular uh, appreciation of them. And this is one, the blue-throated mountain gem, uh, which is actually the largest hummingbird to ever occur in the, in the United States. Uh, it's a pretty good size uh, hummingbird um, and pretty remarkable to see uh, up close, especially when it's around with smaller hummingbirds. This was in a portal in uh, the very, uh, or near the border of New Mexico. And another rare visitor to uh, Southeast Arizona, the violet crowned hummingbird, uh, also one that's uh, seemingly a little more common. Um, the, uh, this was at the famous Patent Center for Hummingbirds in, in uh, uh, Patagonia. And uh, I, I like this because you can see his little, little feet here. Uh, but uh, hummingbirds like, like uh, swifts, um, can't walk or hop. They can only perch. Uh, so they've got these neat little feet, but they really can only use them for one thing. Well, two things. They can scratch with it, too. Uh, is, that uh, is that a ring? Is, that bird is it banded? No, I don't, I don't believe so. Yeah, I see what you mean, but I, I don't think that's a, a band. <coughs> Yeah, we saw this bird at several different locations, including a Jay Hands feeders in his yard uh, in near Sierra Vista and another on a nest as well. This is one of the smallest hummingbirds. This is a calliope hummingbird. This is a young male. Unfortunately, it's young because the, the adult has these beautiful gorget, long streaming gorget feathers 
Um, and, uh, that's a target bird for me to try to get a picture of a, of a nice male. I do have one picture of a male, but it's not terribly good. <laughs> but uh, uh, at any rate, this is one of the smallest hummingbirds. And I, I note it because uh, uh, it weighs less than two and a half grams, which is less than the weight of a penny. Uh, and the largest ones like that uh, blue-throated mountain gen we just saw gets up to about 18 grams, which is a little less than an ounce. A little more than, a, I'm sorry, a little more than a half an ounce. This is a pretty uh, relatively common breeder in the West of the, of the United States. It's a uh, broad-billed hummingbird, but one of the more colorful of uh, the hummingbirds that we see uh, in the U.S. And it has that bright red lower lower uh, mandible. And it's the female is strikingly different uh, from the male. A lot of most hummingbirds are uh, are uh, have a sexual dimorphism. They're they're uh, males and Females are different uh, in their plumage, display different characteristics. Uh, you can barely make out this, this bird still has that reddish lower mandible, uh, which is a, a good clue if you, if you it's in a bunch of other hummingbirds and you're trying to separate it out. By the way, it's a common assumption uh, that uh, flowers are red to attract hummingbirds and our feeders are red to attract hummingbirds, but that's not necessarily the case. Flowers are actually red to discourage insects because insects are, are red and green, green blind. So when they see a red flower, all they see is green. So they're not necessarily attracted to it. And there's a reason for that. Flowers try to distract insects because they wanted to attract hummingbirds because hummingbirds will actually feed in the cold and the rain of the Northern Andes, of the upper Andes. And insects won't. So this is how hummingbirds and flowers uh, benefit each other and uh, how flowers have evolved to attract hummingbirds just so that they can uh, assure themselves of uh, pollination. And I'll touch a little bit more on that when I get to uh, another section. Hummingbird families, and I don't mean the taxonomic families, I mean the families like mom and dad families uh, the males establish and defend uh, productive nectar <laughs> supplies uh, set out of territory to attract a mate. But once they do, that's it. They don't have anything else to do with the, uh, the, the, the female, the nest, the babies, nothing. By coincidence, they'll continue to defend their, their feeding territory, which by coincidence will help the female. But he has nothing to do with it. And in fact, uh, the female lays her two eggs uh, and uh, does all the feeding, builds the nest, raises the young. Uh, hummingbirds just don't pair up like many other uh, bird species do. And in fact, prior to migration, and I'm sure you've noticed this around your feeders, uh, the males come, come around and, and try to chase off everybody, including their own family or what they don't even recognize them as their family. They just, they're just uh, greedy. Uh, and working hard to get ready to migrate like uh, the rest of the of the birds are. But the female does all the work, including all the dusting, like this one is doing. <laughs> Actually, this is a, a female, Anna's hummingbird, who is uh, uh, building her nest. Um, and uh, it's pretty much, she does all the work, just, just like uh, the rest of us. I know uh, I get accused of that myself. <laughs> Uh, not carrying my weight sometimes, but that's okay. But uh, they succeed. So we'll take a quick bathroom break here if anybody needs to, uh, or if there's any any questions at the moment while we uh, we, we pause for the pause that refreshes. This uh, I've probably shot five or six thousand hummingbird pictures, and I've caught two doing this. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, no mating pictures, no. and, and only one nest that I found myself. I've, wow. the, the, uh, nests are very hard to find, actually. I've been looking for the one in my yard for 10 years, <laughs> and uh, they, they, uh, they hide them well. They're kind of, I just happened to be in the woods 
and I saw a hummingbird. I'm looking up in a tree for something else, and I just caught a hummingbird fly in, and I saw it land. I said, oh, look at that. <laughs> and it was a nest. It was at Flanders Nature Center. And it was pretty far away, but I got a picture of it that was identifiable. You could see the hummingbird. You could see the nest. So I was, I was pretty proud of myself for that. So we're going to move on to another one of the unique abilities of hummingbirds, and that's their flight. And I'm sure we're all pretty familiar with uh, how unique hummingbirds are. They can hover and fly backwards, which uh, no other birds can do. Insects can do it because they are they have similar uh, uh, flight mechanisms, but uh, no other birds can do that. And it's fascinating to watch, of course. And uh, the means by which they do it is a unique shoulder joint configuration, which allows the wings to flip, uh, creating lift on both up and down stroke. And uh, I think I finally learned to understand what lift meant when I was studying hummingbirds, <laughs> you know, it's, it's uh, you know, you look out the window of an airplane and you see the plane and say, well, how, what is that doing that's keeping us up in the air? And it has to do with air pressure, and I don't even know, but uh, uh, it's easier to understand if you look at hummingbirds. So when you're looking at a hummingbird and you're seeing it beat its wings, that blur is about 50 to 80 beats per second of a hummingbird. And you, you know, you couldn't even move your fingers that fast, right? much less flap your arms. <laughs> and males of some species do pretty elaborate flight dances. If you watch your uh, ruby throats, the male ruby throat hummingbird does this big U-shape. The, the female is sitting on a branch and he's doing this big U-shape dive and swoop up in front of her uh, to get her attention. And if he does it well enough, she'll mate with him. If he doesn't, he's out of luck. She'll go looking elsewhere. So watch the different positions. Uh, this is a male uh, Anna's hummingbird, which, by the way, is one of only two hummingbirds in, uh, in, that occur in North America that have uh, their uh, gorget the same color as the top of their head, that red color. And that's just an aside. Put it in your notes because it will be on the quiz. Yeah. So if you watch the different positions of his wings as he feeds, See how that wing flips over with every flap. Pretty amazing. Here's another amazing thing about hummingbirds is their iridescence, their colors. Like um, it's also rare among birds that they uh, they have these colors uh, occur through mechanical means, not not pigments. Like most most bird colors are are your basic pigments, like in paint. Uh, but these are uh, are almost prismatic. They are uh, reflections of layers of uh, uh, in the feathers that uh, refract the light and cause that. Uh, uh, coloration to reach your eye and other birds' eyes. Colors are often more dramatic in, in subdued lighting, which is kind of counterintuitive. Uh, if you think about pigments in the, in the bright light, it's brighter, and, <laughs> but uh, sometimes the iridescence is uh, brighter. And I've noticed this for photographing uh, hummingbirds too. Uh, you can definitely see that in some subdued lights, the, the, uh, the color is more dramatic. And of course, the angle at which the light strikes the feathers influences the, the color that's reflected. Colors are advertising, basically, both to prospective mates as well as uh, warning to uh, competitors for food sources, uh, similar to other birds, too. But if you watch, uh, you can see what I mean about how the angle uh, of light striking uh, the feathers of that bird changed the color of that. So sometimes you'll see uh, your ruby-throated hummingbird will look basically like it's black-throated. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, I've had people call me and say, oh, I've got a black-throated hummingbird at my feeder. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, uh, I'm sure you do, but it's actually a ruby-throated hummingbird. Mm -hmm. But um, there is a, a black-chinned hummingbird, which is actually the uh, Western counterpart to the ruby-throated hummingbird. Um, uh, but uh, uh, it... Uh, 
it's very similar to the ruby-throated hummingbird. There's only uh, a couple of species that have iridescence in their flight feathers. That's because the, the uh, physical me mechanization of uh, iridescence, the physics of it, weakens the feather structure. So only a few uh, hummingbirds actually uh, show iridescence in their flight feathers, such as this one does, the great sapphire wings. Um, oftentimes you'll see uh, uh, hummingbirds with larger and longer wings are, are uh, occurring in the higher altitudes and they need bigger wings to be able to stay afloat because the air is so thin. This is one of them. This was way up in the Andes Mountains. I'm going to talk about feeding strategies. They, uh, they're fascinating different strategies that they apply uh, to, to feeding. And again, watching these for the last eight or so years, I've been able to observe it. And uh, I mean, I, obviously, I, I learned a lot of this stuff reading books and the like. And, and uh, But I've also... Once I've read up about it, I've watched it really closely uh, on some of these trips, and it's really, really kind of fascinating. Trap lining is one, uh, one of the primary mechanisms that they use visiting a, a series of productive sources, more or less in sequence. Uh, usually, though, they're spread apart so far that they are not easily defended. Uh, so they basically make the roots, and by the time they get around the loop, the root, the flower has put out more nectar so they can start all over again and go around their loop. And how long does a loop? Oh, it depends on the bird and how big, yeah. It, it could vary. It could vary um, anywhere from a few minutes to an hour or more. Territorial uh, hummers will concentrate on a single bush or, or a group of, of flowers in a patch and defend it aggressively. And I'll show you an example of that in a moment. Uh, there are filters and raiders, which I kind of like those titles. They sneak into a protected food source and try to get, get by the defenders of, uh, of their bush or tree or flower patch. And I'll show you examples of that too. And then there's piercers that poke holes in the base of the flowers. Instead of going in through the flower opening, they'll go and, and poke a hole uh, in the base of the flower. And I'll, I'll explain that a little bit too. And insects as well. Um, obviously, uh, uh, like all of us, they need uh, birds need protein to build muscles. Uh, insects provide that protein. Uh, and they, that makes about 10% of their, uh, their diet overall. They, uh, uh, the females feed a lot more on insects to feed their babies because babies really need a lot of protein uh, to, to develop and grow. So they feed a slurry of nectar and, uh, and insects, gnats and aphids and those kinds of things that they catch. Uh, they catch them in the air like fly catching or they pick them off of the underside of leaves on the trees. This is a collared Inca who's been defending a territory uh, pretty aggressively, apparently, from the look of his bill, uh, and probably for a while. So uh, he's probably an old timer. Uh, there was a row of flowering bushes, sort of like a hedgerow, uh, ornamental of some sort around the, a building uh, where we were. And this was in Colombia. And uh, this guy came to the same exact spot. And you can tell if you look at that branch, you see that? spot is worn off right there he sat he, he would sit there and if another bird showed up he'd fly off and chase him away and then come right back and sit at this exact same spot so after i watched him for a few minutes i said oh okay so i went and just sat right there and waited for him to come back and there he did and that's when i noticed his, his bill which which is uh he's getting on but obviously he's successful is he still there? This guy is really nice and friendly looking. This is in Southern Arizona. It's a broad tailed hummingbird, a um, little bit like our uh, ruby throated, uh, but it's also one of the more aggressive birds around feeders. This was at, at um, uh, Beatty's Guest Ranch in, uh, in uh, Sierra Vista. Um, and this, or, I'm sorry, in uh, Hereford, right below Sierra Vista. Uh, and 
this is one of the more aggressive ones. There's a lot of hummingbirds there. This guy chases every one of them. And it's interesting because they have a very unique wing trill in there when they fly. So you, you can hear that the minute you sit down at the feeders and uh, uh, it comes buzzing by and there it is. And it's quite attractive too. Another aggressive uh, uh, feeder, this was in uh, Columbia, crowned wood nymph. And this is one of those uh, filchers. This is uh, one of the smallest hummingbirds of all, the scintillant hummingbird. Uh, it only weighs about two grams. And it'll sneak in to, to defended territories to try to filch uh, from their supplies. This is in Panama. Um, it's uh, speculated, I read or heard somewhere, that uh, the bigger hummingbirds that would be defending this territory uh, don't even recognize these as hummingbirds. They think they're insects because they, they, they're they so small and they fly more like insects than bigger hummingbirds do. Uh, and so they think uh, that's just an insect. I'm not, I'm not worried about him. Uh, and so they can sneak in and get, uh, and get a, a, a nip, as it were. And I'll point out here too, this is a very small little tiny thing. And it's actually a dinosaur like all hummingbirds are, like all birds are. Uh, and it's hard to believe, but this bird evolved along the same line as Ty Tyrannosaurus rex. Uh, it is in that, that same family that led to the birds who managed to survive the apocalypse uh, because they were birds. Uh, at the time, of course, they weren't hummingbirds at that time, uh, but birds uh, which feed on uh, seeds uh, and the like on the ground, uh, were able to survive with the loss of all the vegetation because there were still a lot of seeds on the ground. Uh, and they were able to fly and get away from uh, fires and things of that sort. So that's how they uh, became so successful and managed to survive as our only uh, remaining dinosaurs. There's a Rufus Gape Hill Star doing the normal thing, helping to pollinate that flower. And this is an Empress Brilliant, which is poking the flower to get at the base of it. And I'll tell you why in a moment. Um, migratory hummingbirds, and by the way, only, only the hummingbirds in North America, that is uh, around the United States and, and that like, are really truly migrants. The neotropical mig uh, hummingbirds don't really migrate. They may migrate up altitudinally up and down the mountain a little bit, depending on weather conditions, but they don't migrate the way uh, our, our birds do. But they all have to double their weight, these birds do, before they head out, which is why you see them so frantically working your feeders um, uh, in, the, in the fall before it's time to leave. And of course, many feeders uh, have benefited hummingbirds uh, which may account in some cases for some range expansions. Uh, some uh, evidence is that more hummingbirds are spending the winter along the Gulf Coast because there's so many feeders there. So many people put out feeders that uh, ruby-throated hummingbirds and buff-bellied hummingbirds mm -hmm. uh, and even rufous and, uh, and some others, western hummingbirds, are staying along the Gulf Coast instead of uh, continuing on farther south. And again, this is a rufous hummingbird that uh, was in Westport several years ago, uh, managed to stay uh, quite late into the fall because of the, the feeders. Feeding hummingbirds along the Gulf Coast is a big deal too, when they have, they have festivals and everything to celebrate the hummingbirds coming uh, and staying. Uh, and one other note about feeding, hummingbirds have to be pretty careful about bees because they're so small that a single bee sting could actually be fatal. So uh, when you see them fighting with honeybees at your feeder or uh, avoiding hummingbirds at your feeder, uh, that's why they, uh, they do have to be pretty careful. This is a uh, Allen's hummingbird in Arizona. We've talked about flowers and, and hummingbirds. There is this ecological symbiosis. Um, some of them have evolved in tandem, resulting in specially designed bills, as well as specially designed flowers, 
uh, to adapt uh, to each other. Flowers benefit from the pollination just as they do from insects, as we see. Uh, some flowers have evolved especially to attract hummingbirds, which, as I mentioned before, uh, feed in the wet and cool conditions, such as the upper uh, reaches of the Alps. And insects tend to feed, avoid those conditions, or at least not to feed when it's cold and wet. Oops, hit the wrong button. And of course, as we all worry about climate change, that uh, may also be putting some uh, hummingbirds at risk uh, and other birds, of course, as well. You see how perfectly fitted this flower and this hummingbird are, the purple throated mm -hmm. wood star. Mm -hmm. This is a Costas hummingbird with his uh, Yosemite Sam mustache there. And, uh, but you can see the pollen dusting on his uh, forehead and around his bill. Um, he, uh, sometimes it gets so thick that it can confuse you, if, especially if it's a, a female or an immature bird. That you go, hey, what's that, a yellow-headed hummingbird? You know, but there's really no such thing, uh, at least not uh, to our knowledge yet. But... Um, they do, they do get dusted over. This is just the bill of a, uh, of a Lucifer, female Lucifer hummingbird. And you can see it gets pretty well coated, so it works. And I mentioned how uh, important it is for flowers to have somebody to pollinate them in, in uh, wet and cold uh, climates. And this is a speckled, speckled hummingbird feeding in the rain uh, in Colombia. And I would also note that hummingbirds like to take a shower, either in a, in a bathtub, in a, a pool, in a leaf, or in the rain. This is a, in a rain shower in, uh, in Colombia. Uh, and he just, uh, just showered off. It was beautiful to watch. And then he was all fluffed up and dry. This is an uh, uh, Andean emerald. Handsome little fella, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Again, those feet. <laughs> another amazing thing about hummingbirds, you may notice that I keep saying that, but uh, here's another one, uh, is their feeding me mechanisms. Research at our own uh, Yukon by uh, Margaret Rubega and others uh, has revised recently our understanding of how hummingbirds feed. Uh, I'm sure early people watching hummingbirds say, oh, they, uh, they have a straw for a tongue. Isn't that fascinating how they do that? Uh, this is a scaly breasted hummingbird, by the way, if you're taking notes uh, or if you're not, it's still a scaly breasted hummingbird. Uh, but uh, what it turns out is they uh, actually have a mini uh, pump uh, as a tongue. They have fork tips which lap up the nectar and, uh, and then the tongue motion squeezes it along grooves in the tongue. And uh, it uh, is remarkably effective, but it's also fast. Yeah. It, uh, you, you, the in and out, um, you know, like 20 times a second. The tongue may be twice as long as the bill and uh, has to wrap around the base of the skull when it's withdrawn. I mean, you can see that, you see here, this is this is only half of the tongue, right? So when it comes in, where's the other half go? Right around here. Um, that's a, how do you photograph that? That, I was sitting on my patio with a beer <laughs> and a camera, and a camera, which I always do. And uh, I'm not sure why he was doing that. Uh, the feeder was closer to me, and that was uh, maybe 10 feet away uh, across the yard. And uh, I, I, you know, I'm just snapping away as he was hovering there for a minute and uh, happened to get this one. That's the trick, and I don't want to give away any secrets here. But <laughs> the trick is to get a camera where you push the button and it takes, uh, you know, like 12 Right. shots per second you know uh, and uh and you just uh, then you go back and you spend several hours 
at the computer, throwing out uh, 99% of the pictures that you took until you get the one that you wanted. One more bathroom break opportunity. This is the other one that I managed to, to catch. <laughs> this is a purple-throated wood star, female. Uh, one of the small little hummingbirds uh, looks big there, but it's not. It's uh, uh, probably less than three grams. Smaller than our uh, ruby-throated hummingbird. Well, enough science. Uh, you got all that down, I'm sure. Uh, we can... Uh, just now maybe go through some pretty pretty bird pictures and uh, marvel at the amazing variety that uh, can be found in the hummingbird family. I got to note that it was kind of tough to choose photos. As I said, I've probably taken maybe over 6,000 of them and I probably have a thousand or two uh, in my library, but um, I, uh, I had a lot of fun actually going through them to put this all together. So, uh, by far the greatest diversity uh, of uh, hummingbirds is in the Neotropics. Uh, that's from Southern Mexico all the way to Southern South America. And, and they range by the way, uh, hummingbirds in general, all the way from Alaska to Tierra del Fuego. Um, the, uh, the Rufus hummingbird that I mentioned before, talked about before actually has been known to nest in Southern uh, Alaska. So uh, wow. um, they, uh, they are remarkably uh, well developed and uh, done pretty pretty amazing job with their opportunities. I'll probably have to go through these kind of quickly, but uh, uh, I'll give you a link to my uh, Flickr page later if you want to go back. I have a whole album of hummingbird photos in there. Uh, and shameless plague, plug, I'll be glad to sell you a, a book uh that uh, pretty much summarizes everything we're talking about here that i have put together also that i could show you columbia alone has over 145 species uh of of hummingbirds and in ecuador uh, i know michael's been to ecuador a few times uh, uh i was there last year and we had i think uh 68 different species of hummingbirds on, in one three-week trip so one tree, one pair. Okay. I'm not photographing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you just started, Michael. You got plenty of time. And I also uh, really like the names, as I mentioned before. Uh, Neotropic hummingbirds have really nice names, really descriptive names. Unlike a lot of the ones that uh, uh, we have in, in the United States, like Allen's, Anna's, and Ribbley. Who cares? You know, describe the bird is what that's what's really important. Here's a couple of the of the more primitive hummingbirds, the long-billed hermit, the green hermit, characterized or identifiable by those long, heavy curb curb bills and by those long central tail uh, feathers that are typical of most hermits, not all, but uh, but most of the hermits, uh, which also include uh, uh, barbed throats and sickle bills. I haven't photographed a sickle bill yet. That's a that's a, a bucket list bird I want to try to get. But uh, I did get a barb throat. This is a pale-tailed barb throat that uh, that I just shot in Ecuador. Uh, this uh, twenty-two. I mentioned um, these these birds again. That heavy bill sort of gives away that uh, originally they were primarily insect eaters. And uh, over time, as they learn to drink nectar, uh, they uh, evolve, different species evolve thinner, longer, and more uh, tailored bills for specific flowers and the like. There's, uh, there's a white vented plumilateer. There's only two birds called plumilateers. Uh, white vented and uh, see, Rufus tailed, I think is the other one. Um, but uh, it's again, it's a pretty large hummingbird, large heavy bill, but interesting plumage that uh, turquoise blue green color. This is a pretty rare one. This is a blue throated golden tail. This was in Panama. This is one of the, the first hummingbirds that I shot. 
uh, on my first trip to Panama in 2016, I think it was. And it uh, it was ho hovering around the verbena flowers for a while, but it was a nice one to get. It's not an easy one to find. And we all love these uh, long tailed Some hummingbirds have evolved these really elaborate plumage characteristics, like these really long tails on this long tailed sylph. This one was in, I don't want to say Colombia. And the violet tailed sylph. It was long thought that these were the same species, but eventually they learned that they are actually two different species. And there's a couple of others that have these long tails as well. Um, but they're really amazing to watch them. Uh, very agile. You'd think they would be clumsy with all those uh, feathers hanging off of them, but, uh, but they, uh, they do a pretty nice job flitting around the flower bushes. Fun bird. And just so you think I'm a chauvinist, this is a beautiful violet-tailed sylph also, but this is the female. And she doesn't have a long tail, but she's just as beautiful in my eyes uh, and uh, just as fun to watch. I mentioned names. This is one of my favorite names because it really describes a bird. It's a purple bib, white tip. It's got a purple bib. And it's got a white tip. <laughs> One of the things I'm fascinated about evolutionarily is what the heck is this? <laughs> a lot of hummingbirds have this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I haven't yet found an answer to that. So when you find it, please text it to me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure somebody has thought about it or is doing a PhD thesis on it mm -hmm. as we speak. I wish it was me, but that ship has sailed but it's really kind of a fun name for a cool mm -hmm. bird. And another neat name, wire-crested thorntail. Unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, this is a female. Uh, the, unfortunately, it's not a photograph of a male, uh, which does have a, a very uh, unique wire, wiry uh, set of feathers coming out of the, the uh, crown. Um, and uh, here's another evolutionary question for you. What is this? And, and a lot of hummingbirds have this also. Uh, could be something to deflect a predator. I don't know. Again, I haven't seen the research on it as yet. <laughs> yeah. I'm over here, buddy. Yeah, there you go. That might be it. That might be it. This is another appropriate name, a shining sunbeam. Be a good, good, uh, bird to see in the sun. It's actually more colorful than this photograph shows you. The back of it has a variety of colors in, uh, in the back as well. Yeah, yeah, that is a long wing. Again, this is this is way, way up in the Andes. Uh, so it, it really kind of needs some big wings to, uh, to get around. There's uh, three species called coronets. Uh, and they're not really very similar to look at. This is a velvet purple coronet, which all shades of blue and purple and amazing. And it's pretty big too. Does it have a <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure where that name comes from, actually. These, happen, these three do happen to be closely related taxonomically, but sometimes the names that are given to them, like, star frontlet or, or uh, a wood star, they aren't necessarily uh, that closely related. Uh, they might not be in the same genus, for instance, but somehow they got those names because, you know, wood star, hey, it looks like a wood star. And so they all became wood stars. But uh, this is a chestnut breasted coronet, which is a good bit smaller uh, than the one we just saw and totally different color scheme. <clears throat> different color patch behind the eye. It's not bright white. Yeah. And this is the buff-tailed coronet. 
again, it's a little smaller uh, than the others. And again, a slightly different uh, uh, plumage pattern. Neat thing about these guys is uh, they have a habit, all coronets have a habit of when they perch, they hold their wings open for a split second. So if you're aware of that, you can, uh, uh, you can get a picture like this, which is really hard to do. I'm sure you've noticed in any of the flight pictures I've showed you, the wings are almost always blurry because I, I don't go to the trouble of setting up uh, like some photographers do elaborate flash systems right. where they catch every, you know, stop, complete stop motion. Um, I'm, you know, it's kind of self-serving, but my argument is I like to show a little motion, it, it, you know, it makes the bird look alive. Uh, but in this case, uh, it's a nice way to show what this bird does. One of its habits is to do just that. When it lands, it just cocks its wings like that for a second. So if you're aware of that, and uh, especially in conditions like this, because this was, it was like almost everywhere. It's dark and it's uh, sometimes foggy. And so it, photography can be difficult. Sometimes it's easy because a lot of the places you stay at have feeders and perches around the feeders. So you can, uh, you know, if you're patient, you can sit and get the photographs you want. But often it's raining. It's, you know, it's foggy, it's windy, uh, and uh, it's, it's really tough to get a high quality uh, photo uh, like this. So when a bird stops for you, <laughs> that makes it a little easier. Because as you probably noticed, hummingbirds don't stop a lot. Although they do spend a lot of time perched because they, they need to digest. They have to feed every 15 to 20 minutes they have to eat or else they would die and uh, uh, so they have to after they fill up a little bit they have to sit for a few minutes to digest it and uh, and then go back uh, and that's why by the way I didn't mention that uh, the last one I sh showed you that was relieving uh, herself um, their their uh, uh, excretions are almost pure water uh, because they take everything out of the sugar water and all that goes through them is almost all pure water. Maybe a little bit of bug if they have happened to be eating bugs, but almost always it's pretty much just pure, pure water. Um, and these are those same uh, buff-throated, uh, I mean, uh, buff-tailed, uh, Cornets, and you know they they all look friendly. They sit around and talk about the weather and the sugar content and those kinds of things. But then, as soon as one of them goes to try to feed, everybody starts attacking each other. They, they chase each other all around the place. And then they go back and then down. How was that? That was pretty good. How about you? Yeah, I liked it. Yeah, okay. So they uh, they get along when they're sitting, but not when they're feeding. There's uh, eight different, uh, nine different species of sun angels. Tourmaline, that's a nice color. I, I mean, uh, how often do you see tourmaline? I guess it's a jewel, right? Is it a gem? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe that's what hummingbirds are called, the jewels of the sky. So uh, uh, that's, that's a good one. I don't think I've seen that in nature anywhere else. These, these birds are high in the Andes, only in Colombia and Ecuador. A lot of these birds have very limited ranges, uh, which is why it's fun to go to these places because you see birds that you'll never see anywhere else. This one is in Southern Ecuador and, and into Peru, the amethyst-throated humming, the sun angel. And this is a little sun angel. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they they do have some similar characteristics, mm -hmm. but slightly different color gorgets in every case, including on this one, the multicolored purple-throated sun angel. This is one of my favorites. A really pretty bird. This was in uh, Ecuador. There's 10 different brilliance, 
This is the Empress Brilliant. I mentioned it before, this was piercing the flower. I showed you that a little while ago. You can see why that short bill, that bill's too short to get into that flower far enough to reach the nectar. So that's why it goes and pokes a hole instead to get to the nectar, the shortcut. They're, they're uh, evolutionarily smart. And this is a violet fronted brilliant. I'm not sure why it's violet fronted. It really should be violet headed, yeah. green fronted, but yeah, he's looking right at you. Yeah. You can, somebody mentioned the big eyes. You can tell how important wow. eyesight is for hummingbirds. You know, they have to see everything, especially insects if they're hawking little tiny insects in the air. So how do they get the insects with that tongue? They nope, they catch them with their bill. Yep. Okay. Yeah, they just, they just uh, open the bill and, and snap it shut. This is one of the more dramatic hummers, a rainbow star frontlet. Pretty large for a hummer and very aggressive also, chases everybody else away. This uh, this bird was at the same location as the, uh, as this, uh, I'm sorry, as the uh, purple throated uh, one that I showed you. They were, they were at feeders. Uh, in the woods, I'm not sure who took care of these feeders, but they were a pretty good hike into the woods, and there were some feeders. And uh, this this bird and the uh, and the uh, rainbow fronted star frontlet were fighting over the feeders in the woods. Uh, again, it was raining, and uh, it was dark, <laughs> but I managed to squeeze out a couple of decent shots of that guy. This is one of the more demure, this is on the other side of the spectrum compared to the last one. This is a green thorn tail. Only the male has these uh, long pointy tail feathers. Uh, also has the advertising on the, on the rump here for some reason. Uh, space for rent, I guess. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but a cute little guy, but not much is known about this bird. Actually, I was surprised to learn that after having seen it, there were several of them. This was at a lodge and there were feeders and uh, there were several of these birds there. But uh, then I, when I re read up on it afterwards, I see that uh, very little is known about it, about its life history or uh, even its range. I'm sorry, that was Ecuador. This, is, this one's a little unique. This is a, a Neblina hummingbird, a Neblina metal tail. Uh, it, it lives only in a very small area in the misty highlands in the Andes. This is in, only in Southern Ecuador and Northern Peru. Uh, neblina means mist in Spanish. So this is a, a mist forest uh, species. Uh, this was one of the birds the trip we were on, the, it was advertised as a uh, endemic specialties trip. Mm -hmm. So our guide felt obligated to uh, chase down all these uh, endemics of which this, this bird is one. It only occurs in this relatively small area. Uh, so, so it turns out our guide applied what I ended up calling our three, two, one, one uh, formula of chasing birds, which is drive for three hours, <laughs> hike for two miles, <laughs> stand for one hour, see one bird <laughs> and this was one of them we had to we had to go up and down this mountain and every time we would go down the mountain he'd say oh wait and we'd have to turn around and go back up the mountain uh and we finally uh finally our guide spotted this for us and uh we got some pretty decent looks at it uh really really nice to see such a and very unique coloration too for a, for a hummingbird but he still has a nice little white spot there behind his eye. Mm -hmm. Got to work on that. But uh, it was well worth it in the end, especially because we were able to get photographs. This is where that happened, by the way. This is on the top of Ciro Toledo uh, in uh, Southern Ecuador. Nice views, really, really nice to watch the mists go through the valleys below you. It was really cool. Mm -hmm. 
Well, it's the Andes. It's the it's the uh, there's two ranges of Andes that go through Ecuador, uh, whereas in Colombia there's three ranges of the Andes. Um, this this was the uh, uh, western range in Ecuador. We we uh, ended up in both. We we uh, I'll show you photographs from the eastern range uh, in Ecuador in a moment. There's uh, five different species of violet ears. This is the sparkling violet ear, which is uh, kind of dramatic in a lot of ways. And uh, has a violet ear, as does, as does the uh, lesser violet ear, which used to be the green violet ear, but it was then split from the Mexican violet ear. So now there's Mexican violet ear, green violet ear, lesser violet ear, um, and uh, sparkling violet ear, and a couple of others. Oh, including this one, which is the brown violet ear, which is an interesting color uh, scheme. Uh, you get a close up of those. those uh, Lovely little feathers. <clears throat> there are 15 different wood stars in seven different genuses. I mentioned before, they're not necessarily uh, closely related or that closely related to be in the same genus. Uh, this is a purple throated wood star in the rain, of course, which is why it's kind of blurry, but uh, <clears throat> identifiable. This is a white-bellied wood star. Very tiny, tiny little birds. These are in the two and a half gram category. And then there's uh, 10 different species of coquettes which is kind of an intriguing name. Uh, and she looks rather coquettish, I, yes. I think, actually, in this, in this view anyway. But what's dramatic about coquettes is this. They, uh, most of them have, the males have these fabulous uh, Ziggy Stardust crowns that they, uh, that they, they flash. This, this is uh, another one of those three, two, one, one, treks mm -hmm. to a verbena garden, a private garden um, that uh, meant we had to slog up a hill in the rain, stand around in the rain uh, with about 20 other people uh, in the rain or under a lean-to watching not spangled coquettes <laughs> feeding at the uh, verbena flowers. Uh, until all of a sudden, one of our party students said, "There, there's one. There he is. There he is." Oh, we all jumped up, and, uh, and I rattled off three or four hundred uh, pictures, and uh, uh, got got several that were certainly acceptable. And uh, this is a male with the white stripe. Yeah, this is a male. Yeah, yeah. The white stripe is not a sexual thing. It's, uh, it's. I don't know what it is. But it was really, really worth it. This was one of the highlights of our trip, actually. It was uh, one of the rarer birds and most fun to see. How's this for oh, photographic expertise, huh? <laughs> we all this, uh, this is a dusky star frontlet. It is actually identifiable uh, by the, the, the color patterns you see there, the, uh, the gold, the blue, and the green. Uh, that is definitively is uh, a dusky star frontlet that we had pretty good looks at. Uh, we had to stand around for quite a while. This is on the top of Ciro Montezuma. And we had to stand around for quite a while uh, at a feeder. Finally, it came in and uh, we got a look at it at the feeder. And just as I get the camera up, it flew right at me, wow. took off, never to be seen again. <laughs> so it was pretty much a real heartbreaker, but uh, I still count it as one of my uh, hummingbird photos because it is identifiable uh, as a dusky star frontlet. And, uh, 
but uh, it was really, uh, it's a critically endangered species, by the way, and it only occurs at two locations high in the Andes uh, in Colombia. And we saw this, I said, on Cerro Montezuma, which was pretty near a, an army base, a military base, which is a little unnerving at first. Um, see all these young fellows with their uh, rifles uh, looking at us. But it turns out that they uh, were very friendly and they welcomed tourists and they were very proud of their uh, facility uh, and, uh, and what it meant to uh, the country and to the, uh, to the tourism business. So this was our group with the, with the, with the army group that came down to, to greet us uh, and talk with us in a pretty dramatic setting. Um, and it was near here that uh, our friend Ed Hagen logged his 6,500th world bird, which was this, I just throw it in for fun. It's a Manchique wood wren uh, that he tabbed as his uh, 6,500th world bird. It's not a hummingbird, but it was it was close. Here's another uh, very rare, uh, one of the more rarest of hummingbirds on another peak in Colombia. Uh, conditions were not really very good. Uh, at 13,000 feet, wind and fog. And at first I thought this was another photo failure, uh, but the magic of Lightroom salvaged this shot uh, of another of the rarest of all hummingbirds is the buffy helmet crest. And they're kind of unique. They can't hover. They don't have big wings and they can't hover. So they have to cling to the flower like this one is doing uh, in order to feed. The air is just too thin at 12,000, 13,000 feet. Nearby was this golden-breasted puff leg, a uh, little farther down uh, in much better conditions, but uh, really a pretty pretty little bird. And just make out the puff legs, which are the characteristic trait of, of puff legs. Um, yeah, little white, light pantaloons. This is everybody's favorite, the sword-billed hummingbird. He uh, he has uh, evolved with with trumpet flowers. You know those big, long trumpet-like flowers. Uh, that's that's what uh, he has learned over millennia to uh, uh, tap into. These birds are unique uh, among hummingbirds in that uh, they uh, their legs are are multi-jointed. They can actually reach around and scratch their back with their legs because they can't preen with their bill. It's too long, you know? So they can't reach anywhere on their body to preen. So their legs are, are extremely flexible and they can actually reach all the way around and scratch their back. Now this guy's tongue has to probably wrap around his Skull two, two or three times. You have to learn how come it doesn't get tangled up in there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but they make do. So finally, on this uh, on our Ecuador trip, we ended up on the Paramo of the Eastern Andes uh, in southern Ecuador, looking for uh, maybe one of the rarest birds in all the world. Uh, actually, and the bird that was only discovered uh, a few years ago in 2017. This is a, uh, the Paramo at uh, on Ciro de Arcos, about 12,000 feet uh, in the Andean Paramo. And by the way, there's nothing like chasing birds at 12,000 feet to remind you that you're 74 years old. <laughs> because we had to trek across this to get to where the bird was and back. And uh, it's steeper than it looks, but it was fun. And it was worth it because we uh, uh, got to see probably one of the rarest of all hummingbirds, uh, recently discovered a critically endangered blue-throated hill star uh, at about 12,000 feet. There's a, probably fewer than a thousand of them known to exist uh, in an area of about 43 square miles, which is just a little uh, bigger than the town of Woodbury. And only on... Uh, uh, Ciro de Arcos. 
on this one mountain. There's a closely related uh, uh, hill star, Andean hill star, which looks very similar, but uh, is a different species. And uh, it was only really that this guy was found in, uh, what did I say, 2017. Was it puffed up? So he was pretty close. Yeah, it was probably, it was pretty chilly that, yeah, exactly. And so one more drink for the road and we'll say good night. Uh, Hummers do need to load up before going to bed because yeah. they have to go into a torpor to survive the night because they can't feed every 20 minutes like they have to during the day. So they fill up as much as they can and they slow down their metabolism. Their heart rate goes from uh, from like uh, resting heart rate is something like 400 beats per minute. Uh, heart rate when he's doing what he's doing right there is like 1200 beats a minute. Uh, when he goes to sleep at night, it drops down to about 40 beats a minute. Uh, and, and they go into torpor. So that's a uh, pretty amazing uh, yeah, adaptation. Warm weather? Well, it depends how deep into torpor they have to go, but okay. they can't feed at night, so they definitely have to slow their metabolism yeah. down one way or another. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Any more questions while we're here? I have a point for you, uh, President. Um, we have a very large uh, trumpet vine at one end of our deck. Uh -huh. And I often see ruby throats pierce the bottom of the there you go. to get the nectar. Yeah, they don't have long enough bill to get all the way in there. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> well, that's the end then. Thanks. You can see more of my photos there if you want, and uh, some blog stories about some of my travels. Or you can drop me an email if you have any more questions or uh, interest. And thanks again for coming and enjoyed your company. That's great. Great to see everybody. Thank you.